ready for the holidays? Better be. They're here. So, man, what a privilege. Where's Max? I've been taking Max to the directions and getting to know him and getting to baptize him. Man, what a morning. It's awesome. Like Jeff said, this is our third week of surviving Christmas. First week, Brian Stooch will talk to you about surviving financially. And he told you how much of like how reserved he was because talking about Christmas before Thanksgiving, especially in church, but we really wanted to jump ahead of things and, and just talk about how God wants us to spend our money and be generous. And then last week, Jim Lee talked about surviving emotionally. And most of you were like, well, it kind of sounded like surviving relationally. Yeah, that's the point. And that's what Jim said. He said so many emotional problems stem from poor relationships. And so he started that. And what he did is he talked about four kinds of relationships. Those kind of people that they don't have any relationships. Now, it might look on the surface like they do, but really when it comes down to it, they're isolated. They have no intimacy with anyone, no quality relationships. And then the next one is people that have a bad relationships. And I, I just want to be honest with you. If you have a lot of bad relationships in your life, can I tell you, I think the common denominator might be you. So if there's a, always a ton of tension in all of your relationships, I would encourage you surround yourself with maybe some better people, or maybe think about what we're going to talk about today, what God has to say about healthy relationships. And then Jim talked about pseudo relationships and the things that we use in this life to replace good relationships. So many things that we do. And I'm not anti-texting, I'm not anti-cell phone, but let's put them down and talk to each other, right? So many things that we do in our lives, like substance abuse, to try to get through and cope. Those are pseudo things that we replace with true relationships. But Jim said, it, whether you have no relationships, bad relationships, or you have pseudo relationships, he said, our will for you is to have good relationships. And let me just tell you, Grace Way, as a pastor, as a pastoral team, there is nothing that we want more for you than to have good relationships. A good relationship with God that bleeds over into having healthy relationships with others, that's what we want for you. And if you would, turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And for some of you, when I say that, you already know what's coming. 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. But you know what? 13 is in between... What? 12 and 14. You guys are, okay, come on. Let's speed it up this morning. No, it's between 12 and 14. And 12 and 14 talk about gifts, about how Paul wanted the Corinthians to change their views and to have a proper understanding on how they use their gifts, their natural talents that with the Holy Spirit are taken and given opportunities in the local church to use them. He wanted them to use their gifts so that people could see Jesus on this earth working in the local body, here at Graceway. But in order to do that, sandwiched in between those two chapters is a chapter on love. And the reason he, he put 13 in there about love is because unless you have good relationships, you will never, ever, ever use your gifts and live in the fullness of Christ, how he wants you to operate in this body. And I encourage you, if you're someone that does not exercise your gifts, you're not using how you, what you've been gifted at at Graceway or another local body, I challenge you this morning, evaluate your relationships because healthy relationships will bleed over into you using your gifts. So 1 Corinthians 13, and it starts out like this in verse 3. And though I bestow, bestow all of my goods, he says, you can give everything away. And though I give my body to be burned, sacrificial giving on the outside. But I have not love, it profits me nothing. How many things get done around the holidays out of duty and obligation without love being involved? You know, it doesn't take a lot of love to go ring a Salvation Army bell. It doesn't take a lot of love to invite people over and just go through the motions and provide a dinner and act like you're having fun. Doing whatever we do without love has no profit. There's no benefit. 
Why do it? And so many of us in our relationships, how much do we do? How much effort do we exert without loving? And God says, it's for nothing. It's for nothing. So in order to have a good, healthy relationship, it has to be centered around love. Love is the essential component. And in in Corinthians, they were a church so similar to the church in the United States today. They had so many problems, divisions and arrogance, and they wouldn't treat one another well, and all of these things, and you know what they were? They were relationship problems. They were relationship problems. And so in order to have the love that God wants us to have and the relationships that he wants us to have, he's going to give us 15 things in 1 Corinthians 13. And what we've done is we've taken them and we've we've boiled them down into four major components, four major aspects of love that God wants us to have. And if you look at verse 4, love suffers long and is kind. God wants us to be patient and long-suffering and kind. For our relationships to be healthy and good, we have to have patience and be long-suffering and kind. You know, what this describes, there are so many circumstances in our life that require patience, right? Somebody pulls out in front of you. Things just in this life that require us to be patient, not just blow up and get angry. But that's not what Corinthians is talking about. It's talking specifically about our relationships with other people. And he says, sometimes it's very difficult to be patient. Those of you that are parents in here, you know. I am impatient all the time and have to be reminded, Stephen, your heavenly father is not that impatient with you. Those of you kids in here, you might be going, yeah, my parents need to learn a thing or two about patience. (laughs) Yeah, you probably do too. We all have so many lessons to learn because we live in this society that breeds now, 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 pleasure now, everything is immediate. And yet God says, I want you to be patient and kind How about being patient and kind when people misuse their authority? That's tough. How about when they misrepresent us? How about when somebody exaggerates your faults? Oh, I can't stand that. When they take a fault and they blow it up and say, you know what you're terrible at? It's hard to be patient, isn't it? And kind. You know, the holidays are so dangerous because they heighten all of our senses. Our relationships are just under the microscope around the holidays. So when people do things like that, like how about the people that are always seem to be concerned about themselves? You know that person? If something goes goes down, they're going to look out for number one before they think about anyone else and how irritating that can be. You mean I have to be patient with that person? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and it's tough. And you know, it says long-suffering and kind. Kindness is the action. See, long-suffering is passive while kindness is active. It's doing something. Kindness is patience in action. It's how we act from an attitude and a heart of being patient and long-suffering. Patience requires absolute surrender to God and His Spirit. Absolute surrender to be patient. It so, can be so difficult. It can be so difficult. So whenever your iPad goes out in the middle of your sermon, you know what you do? You always have a backup. Be patient. (laughs) God commands it. You know what patience does? Patience recognizes that every single person carries a heavy load. You know what kindness does? Helps them carry it. That is how patience and long-suffering work together with kindness. So if you look around, why should I be patient? You know why? 
Because God is patient with us, and in his kindness, he helps us carry the load. You feel like it's, it's listen, I, even just walking up here and saying, we're going to talk about relationships today. Some of you think, only if you knew, if you only knew who I had to deal with. Do you think God ever goes, you know what, angels? Can you believe this? You know what I have to put up with? And the angels are like, yeah, I wouldn't put up with that. Right? Having a good relationship requires having patience, being a patient person, being kind. The second thing loving, loving relationships require is humility, being humble. You know, we always think about the people that are ahead of us or above us or that we think are superior to us. And we judge ourselves maybe according to those people. But you know what's so crazy? Is that if we understood that humility comes from understanding our stature as opposed to God's stature, we would probably not compare ourselves amongst ourselves, would we? Well, I'm better than so-and-so. Or can you believe that? At least I'm not that bad. No, 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 no. You have to understand. Biblically, we are all sinners that deserve separation from God, that deserve death and hell. But because of his grace and his mercy and his long suffering and his kindness and his love, we don't have to answer the penalty for our sins. And when we keep that in mind, it's a little easier to be, to be patient with people and to be humble because we understand our stature compared with God's. We don't compare ourselves amongst ourselves. And he says, in verse four, love doesn't envy. Love doesn't envy. Love is not jealous. Love is humble. Love doesn't envy. It says, jealousy, you know what it truly is? It's born of covetousness. It begins in wanting something that God doesn't want us to have. And it ends in bitterness. The death is in bitterness. And listen, you might think that you can be jealous and it's just okay. And that it'll just pass, but it won't. You can think I'm going to stay and just be jealous, but you won't end up there. You will end up bitter. And, and hate. Because that's what jealousy does. Proverbs 24, 27, 4 says, Wrath is cruel. Anger is overwhelming. Listen to what it says about jealousy. Who can stand before it? It says, you want to know how bad jealousy is? Because the writer of Proverbs, Solomon, knew that if you let jealousy and envy go, that it will end up in bitterness. You want a recipe for a disaster in a relationship? Bitterness. Wow. Christmas is a great opportunity to teach our children about the contentment and sufficiency that they have in Christ, that, that God provides everything for us. You don't have to be jealous of anyone else. You don't have to envy someone else. You can be content with the gifts and the things that God has given you. And that's a hard lesson. I know it's a tough lesson. How many times do we see people that have other things and we want those? But that's not what God would have for us. And it says in, in verse 4 at the end, it says, Love doesn't parade itself. It's not puffed up. It doesn't vaunt. It's not boastful. It's not arrogant. Well, think about it in the context of Corinthians. They were such an arrogant people that Paul had to tell them three or four times, Stop being arrogant in thinking that you're better than other people. You know what humility is? It's understanding that stature but it's also walking around, acting like Christ in his humility, knowing who we truly are. Now, I know this would never come to play in the holidays, would it? One side of the family being, quote, wealthier than the other side. Anybody ever been through that? Walking into a house and, you know, you walk in, maybe you parents with your kids and they're holding like a stuffed animal and they've got some lifesavers and the cousins or the friends or the family, they're like, yeah, we bought our kids a pony and a rocket ship. No, like a real rocket ship. It goes to the moon. They can go ride their pony around the moon, right? And your kids are like, seriously? Like, what a great opportunity to teach them. This life is not about materialism and consumerism and all those things. 
What a great opportunity. Now, I know this won't hit home with anybody, but you know, might know someone who's like this. No one in here would be like this. How about the grandmother or the mother that is a little bit narcissistic and thinks the whole world revolves around them? And if they're not happy, no one's happy. You've got to dress a certain way to eat. You have, the table setting has to be perfect. The gifts have to be perfect. You have to talk a certain way. You have, and if they're not happy, you just can't have a good Christmas. They think that if they disappeared, Christmas would fall apart. Let me just inform you, there's still Santa. It would be okay. <laughs> just kidding. There's still God. It would be okay. Some of you are like, <gasps> Anybody know anybody like that? You know what that is? That's walking around boastful with arrogance and pride. Something that God hates. To have good relationships, you have to be patient. You have to be kind. You have to have humility. And the third thing is you have to be self-controlled. In verse 5, it says, Love doesn't behave rudely. In the context of Corinthians, think about the, the horrible sexual sin in the church. Not only that, whenever they came together to have the Lord's Supper, the rich people brought better food early and had a party before the poorer people got there. He said, you're always behaving rudely, but not just the things that we do. I might have a problem with every once in a while saying something rude. I know it's hard to believe as a pastor. You're, some of you are in shock. How many of you are with me? You know what James 3 is talking about when you say it's hard to hold the tongue. It's not only what we do, but it's what we say. The rudeness, that's not love. It's never love. It will destroy a relationship. Does not seek its own. Love is not self-seeking. Listen, there's two kinds of people in this world. There's givers and there's takers. Which one do you want to be? Do you want to be the person in a situation that thinks about yourself first or that thinks about someone else? And it's tough. I know how tough it is. In the midst of a relationship and even a heated argument, how tough it can be to think, you know what? No, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to do that and behave rudely. I'm going to think of them. I am going to act with love and compassion. And it can be so tough, but love doesn't always think of, its, of itself. That's not love. Love thinks of others. Love is not provoked. It means it's not easily angered or it's not easily irritated. That's not love. Now, I'm sure there's probably in a group this size somebody that when something happens that's irritating, it's easy to get provoked and you go from a one to a 10 really easy. For me, it's easy to stand up here and teach this because, to be honest, this is not one. Now, there's some of these that I struggle with. Natalia will say all the time, how does that not make you angry? I don't know. It's okay. But I know some of you, the way that God made you, man, that anger, that irritation can go through the roof really, really quick. That's not love. You've got to be patient and long-suffering. It's not easily provoked. Now, I will tell you this. It is easy for me to provoke others. I listen. I'm attentive. I know what buttons to push. And I'm sure those of you that are in relationships, you know the people around you and how to push buttons and provoke. That's never love. That's never love to provoke someone to anger. You want to know why Proverbs tells us parents not to provoke our children to anger? It's not love. It's not loving. <laughs> if you're one of those people that you can just fly off the handle. You're always irritated. You know what you need? You know what the people around you wish that you got this Christmas? Stocking full of chill pills. <laughs> That's what they wish. They've been to the pharmacy three times looking for them. <laughs> and you know what? All joking aside, it's an ep epidemic in our nation and even in the church that people, in order to get through the holidays, have to abuse substances. They have to use stuff to cope. And I know in a group this size, there are some of you that you do not think you can get through the holidays without a little help from your friends. You know, Jim Beam, Jack Daniels, Johnny Adderall. <gasps> Ooh, don't go there, that's soccer moms. Oh. 
You don't think you can get through the holidays. You do not think you can survive in your relationships without taking the edge off. I just want to encourage you. You can. There are so many people in this body that have been there and done that. Make this be the day that you seek someone out and say, hey, I can't do it by myself. I got to have help. And as a local church, as a pastoral staff, we love you and we would love to help you with that. If that's you, seek someone out today. There's no love in it. You might think that that's what you need to love, but that's exactly the opposite. You can't love. You can't. Being drugged up. D, it thinks no evil. You know what this is? It's being able to take a wrong and even being able to take a wrong and not counting. Well, that's the eighth time that they've done it, and I will not stand for it, not again. I'm never going back. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to interact. And listen, I'm not talking about not setting boundaries, healthy boundaries for yourself, but some of us, we can't take a wrong. And if we do, we count, and we hold grudges, and we think evil. That's all we think. Oh, well, I'm sure that's what their intention was. I know that's what they intended. That's what they meant. And we can't take a wrong. You know who took the ultimate wrong? Without cause, not guilty. We have Jesus Christ who knows what we went through. God knows what we go through. And he says, you know what love is? It's being able to take a wrong. In in Corinth, they were suing each other. They were suing each other. And you know what Paul said? How dare you? Don't you have people within the church that can judge between these matters? How can you not allow yourselves to take a wrong? Loving your relationships, they're a home for grace and forgiveness. Loving relationships are a home for grace and forgiveness, not for counting wrongs. E, does not rejoice in iniquity, but he rejoices in the truth. I won't mention anything about the TV shows that we watch. I won't do it. I just won't mention it this morning. Rejoicing in sin? Wow. And some of us, some of our best holiday memories are sitting on the couch with some popcorn going, this fight is going to be great. Uncle Joe, the black sheep, just walked in drunk again, said something inappropriate. Now everybody's in a hissy, and we're just sitting there entertained, we're watching. Anybody ever else been there? You know what that is? It's rejoicing in iniquity. God doesn't like that. He doesn't like that kind of dysfunction. It says, love bears all things. It bears all things. And this doesn't necessarily mean bearing one another's burdens, but it means to cover or to protect. I mean, what do you mean by that? There's one story in the Bible that illustrates this so well. You remember when Noah got off the ark and there was a, the, the process of time had passed and he got drunk and he was naked within his tent. And his, his son Ham walked in and saw him and he came out laughing and mocking, which in this culture, in a shame on our culture, would have been a great shame upon Noah, the father. This would have been something that would have been unmentionable. And Ham did that, making fun of his sin. What did Shem and Japheth do? They took a blanket and they walked backwards so they were not to look on him and they covered him. That is what it talks about when it says bearing all things. It means covering somebody's sin. What do you mean that we're supposed to cover it up, sweep it under the rug? No, 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 no. No, Proverbs 10 says hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. Proverbs 17, 9 says he who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates friends. Now, I know we all do it in a loving way, but how many of you get a call from a sibling? Oh, can you... I just, Oh, this Christmas is going to be terrible. Did you know what mom said to dad the other day? Or did you know what Aunt Kathy said to mom? How many of you have ever been there? And the gossip. We never do that about people in church, do we? Uh Uh-oh. That's not love. He says love covers. Love doesn't spread. Love doesn't spread rumors. Love covers and is good. Listen, you may be uncertain what the holidays are going to bring. None of us know. 
This might be outside of your control, the worst Christmas ever, but what you can control are the choices and the manner in which you act and what you say. And I believe with all my heart, this can be the best Christmas for all of us in our relationships, that we can survive and that we can thrive in these relationships because of love, because of love. So the, you know, and as you read down through those things, behaving rudely, behaving rudely and being selfish. Think about how many of our arguments and our relationship problems start with those two things. And then what happens? It escalates. I mean, if you look down through the text, it's amazing because you come down and, oh, somebody escalated it by provoking. And then instead of covering something, somebody started spreading it and saying, well, you know what so-and-so said? You know what? And he says, this pro natural progression in 1 Corinthians 13, and then it comes down to bearing all things and not being able to cover somebody's sin. Think about how quickly a relationship can go downhill if we don't take heed to those things and, and listen and, and align our lives with those things. But you know what? To have good relationships, it's not just the patience and the humility and the self-control. It's being optimistic. A good relationship, surviving this Christmas relationally, will it has to be with you being optimistic. Now, for some of you pessimists, I literally just took a knife and stabbed it through your heart. You just don't touch that one. I can sit here and I want to be, just think the world's going down the tubes and all the relationships are bad. And that's not Christ. Christ was always optimistic. Now, this doesn't mean being naive. It doesn't mean being naive. It doesn't mean being unrealistic. But it does mean being optimistic. Why? What does the text say? It believes all things. He says, love believes all things. And it doesn't mean being naive or unrealistic. You know else what it means? Giving people the benefit of the doubt. That's tough. Well, you don't know. They've said that to me three times before, and it sounded like they said that to me the fourth time. Well, no way. I know what their intentions are. No way. I know it's, how about giving them the benefit of the doubt? That's how our Father God, that's how Jesus Christ treats us, gives us the benefit of the doubt not judging other people's intentions, hoping all things. You know what that means? A rock-solid expectation of hope. That you know that this Christmas is going to be better. And you know why you know it's going to be better relationally? Because you are going to act in love towards others. You might not be able to control what everybody else is going to do, but you know you can come away from those relationships and know that you acted righteously and in love. At the end of Genesis chapter 2, it gives a great definition of a healthy relationship. It says that they were naked and without shame. And that while I'm not advocating going and getting naked for all Christmas, listen, why do I say that? You know what a good definition of a relationship is, a good or healthy relationship? You walk away and there's no shame. Listen, you could be at grandma's house, brother and sisters. You could be somewhere. You could be with friends. It blows up and you walk out the door and your heart might be heavy and you might have reservations about how everyone else acted, but you know, no shame. I did everything I could to be a loving person, to help others love. That's a rock solid expectation of hope. And the last one endures all things. You will persevere and fight for a good relationship. And I know there's some of you in here that have just gone through divorce. You're thinking about it. I know it's tough right now. I know some of you have broken relationships with parents and this season brings up a ton of hurt. Fight. Fight for that relationship. Fight for it. Endure, persevere. Now there's gonna be times when stuff happens out of your control you have to set up boundaries, and I understand that, but there are times when we withdraw because it gets difficult, and I'm just encouraging you, don't give up because you know what love is? It's optimistic. It says if you don't give up, it can be healthy. It means, well, okay, I've had all these negative relationships. You know what love means? That you will find good relationships. Maybe you'll find them, and you'll begin good relationships this Christmas. So it's not just about being patient. Not just about having humility. Also about self-control. 
and about being optimistic. That this can be a great Christmas, that your relationships can succeed. You know, you look to summarize all of this and no one can do it more eloquently than what Paul did. In verse 8, it says, Love never fails. A lot of other things can fail, but love will not. I encourage you. I beg you. This Christmas season can be the best of your life relationally, but it'll take work because being patient, being humble, controlling what we do and what we say, and being optimistic, it's not always easy. But we can do it through the power of Christ. We can do it through the people sitting in this room in Graceway family. We can do this together. We can see relationships reconciled. We can see things mended. God can accomplish all sorts of things through love. He can heal all kinds of dysfunction through love. I look forward to it. I look forward to hearing the stories of us operating this Christmas season and living this Christmas season in love and what God will do. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you. You are a great God. Thank you for being the God of love, a God that is just worthy of all praise. We thank you. We know that we might go through some difficult situations. I pray that you would just help us through them, that you would bear our burdens. We would give everything up to you and we would love the way that you love. Father, we pray all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Stephen. And we just want to thank you guys so much for joining us today. And before we walk out, we're going to do a little more worship. Uh, I'm also going to go ahead and have the ushers come forward. And I want to, I want to tell you guys something. As the communications guy here, um, it does not matter what we do. The most effective way to bring new people in is for you to invite your friends and family. It is the, it is the thing. It is a relationship aspect. So as we gear up for Christmas, and we're going to have a play next weekend, we've got two Christmas Eve services, I encourage you to invite the people you love, to share that time with them, to be able to just share a moment together uh, in worship and just celebrating the Christmas season. So we're going to take the offering here, and we've talked about for months about being a generous church and that what God wants is for us to experience generosity. It's not that he wants the generosity from us, but for us. And uh, so as we do that, I want to remind you guys, you can definitely give through the, uh, the bucket that goes by. You can also use the Push Pay app to do that. Okay, so we'll go ahead and pray for offering, and uh, we'll do a little worship, and we'll end on a wonderful, wonderful note. I <laughs> See what I did there? No. All right. Father, I love you, and I thank you so much for today. Lord, I thank you for this time that we could come together as a family and just worship you and thank you for what you're doing in our life. Lord, I ask that you would take this offering, Lord, and that you would do an amazing work. Lord, I pray that you would change us. I pray that you would change this city, and I pray that you would change the world, Lord, through the love of your Son. And we are just so grateful and thankful that you let us be a part of that process. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.